Deuteronomy 25, let's read uh, verses 1 through 3. It says, If there is a dispute between men and they come to court, that the judges may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence according to his guilt with a certain number of blows. Forty blows he may give him and no more, lest he should exceed this and beat him with many blows above these, and your brother be humiliated in your sight. These first three verses remind us that the purpose of every judge is to justify the righteous and to condemn the wicked. And it seems that whenever a society gets away from this truth, the society slowly but surely crumbles. We know that in Romans chapter 13 verse 4, speaking of government, it tells us that he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. We also see here that the time has to fit the crime. We see no record of jails or prisons in these first five books of the Bible. No mention of jails or prisons for this new nation of Israel, this group of slaves that has now become a nation out in the wilderness. We've seen many different punishments, many of which require the death penalty. But here we see if there's a crime committed that does not require the death penalty or simply being put outside the camp for a certain amount of days, they would be beaten and be beaten in front of the judge and never in excess of 40 blows. The Lord would have this because God knows that we are prone to go overboard. We are prone to allow our emotions to get the best of us. So even God gave rules for those giving the punishment. We know that Paul received this type of punishment in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. It tells us from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. So Paul, serving Christ, sharing the gospel, he receives this beating at least five times times. Then in verse 4, just a standalone verse here, it says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Oxen were used as tractors in this ancient culture and during these times. And the ox was allowed to eat while he was working. He was allowed to eat while he was on the job. Oxen were used to plow fields. They were used to pool threshing sleds, and they were used to crush grain. Here God is commanding his people to allow the oxen to be strengthened from the fruits of his labor. You were not to put a muzzle on the ox, keeping him from being able to eat from his own hard labor. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10, it tells us a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. We can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and Paul uses this scripture not only on one occasion, but on two occasions describing the ministry. And what does ministry look like? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9 through 11 Here Paul says, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It is oxen that God's concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Here Paul saying the reason this is in the book of Deuteronomy is so that as that ox has hope that as he works hard, he's going to be able to eat. 
so should a worker and even a minister be able to plow in hope that he's being fed as he's working hard. I don't know if you've ever been asked, what's your spirit animal? Someone ever asked you that question, right? What animal do you identify most with? Paul here tells us that the spirit animal of someone who's in the ministry, the spirit animal of the pastor, is an oxen. I am in a modern day tractor. That's all I am here. He's not an eagle that's high above everybody else. He's not to be a peacock showing off his feathers. He's not to be a gorilla beating his chest and showing his muscles. But an oxen, someone who's tough, who's strong, who's faithful, a little bit quiet, and just plowing and working hard. This is what a minister is to look like. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul also quotes here, not only Deuteronomy, but Paul also quotes Jesus Christ himself. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, Paul says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. That last sentence there, Paul quotes Jesus from Luke chapter 10, verse 7, that the laborer is worthy of his wages. Here we see that if someone's working in the church and the church is able to pay for them, the the church should be able to do so. Now some people, they take this and they apply this all sorts of crazy ways. In 1 Timothy 5.17 where it says, let him be worthy of double honor. Some say the application of that is see who makes the most money at the church. And how the pastor should get paid double what that person is making. Double honor. Again, out of context. But here what we see is there should be a certain balance to both extremes. Some like to say it's somehow wrong for a pastor or someone working at church to gain a salary from the tithes and offerings at the church. But here Paul's saying that this is God's design. We just have to stay biblical and spirit-led so that a pastor is not fleecing the flock, but also that the flock is not muzzling the ox and the pastor has no hope as he's working hard. Back to Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 and 6. It says, If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. This seems pretty strange to us today, but in many ancient Eastern cultures, they practiced the law of levirate marriage or levirate marriage. It was seen as a travesty if a man died before having anyone to carry on his name and carry on the family inheritance. All of the land of Israel belonged to God, and God, in a sense, was leasing it out to the Israelites. And God wanted them to continue to carry on that inheritance and that family name and that land. We see this verse and this law being used a few times in Scripture. In Genesis 38, verse 8, Judah's son Onan is struck dead by the Lord because his great sin was that even though his brother died and left a widow, he simply wanted the sexual intimacy but did not want to carry on his brother's lineage. This was an abomination to the Lord and he struck Onan dead. That's the bad news. What's the good news? Is the book of Ruth. We see Boaz, on the other hand, was willing to embrace this extra weight and this extra baggage, if you would. Because in Ruth chapter 4, verse 9, it tells us that Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are eyewitnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elamex, 
Then in verse 10 he says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow, I've acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Boaz, being that kinsman redeemer, is willing to marry Ruth, take care of her, feed her, and provide for her, even though he's carrying on the name of whoever was Ruth's first husband. The Pharisees try to trap Jesus with this law in Matthew 22, verse 25, using some story of a man that had seven brothers, and this woman marries the oldest, then that guy dies, then the second brother dies, then the third brother dies, then the fourth brother dies, then the fifth brother dies, sixth brother, seventh brother. You think they'd get a hint after marrying this woman over and over and over again. But this law we see is mainly because God wanted his people to carry on their lineage, to carry on their name, to carry on their inheritance. Even today, especially amongst Hispanics, it's a big deal to be able to have boys so that you can carry on your family's last name. Back to Deuteronomy 25, verse 7 through 9. Here we see what happens if a man does not want to take his brother's wife. Then his brother's wife will go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. I love this because there's being called to the carpet. This guy's doing something unbiblical. The woman speaks to the elders, brings the man to accountability. And now these elders plead with the man saying, hey, this is what God's law requires. Oftentimes we rarely do the biblical calling of calling someone to the carpet. If someone in your life that you're accountable to, that you're connected to, is doing something unbiblical, you should speak to them. And if they don't listen, bring someone else. And if, you don't, if they still don't listen, bring an elder into it. But here in verse 7 through 9, it tells us, If a man did not want to obey God's word in carrying on his brother's lineage, the widow would bring this man to accountability with the elders of the city. Taking the man's sandal was a ceremony to show that this man was letting go of his claim to his dead brother's estate and to the widow. If you remember in the book of Ruth, the first man that's in line to marry Ruth doesn't want to marry her, doesn't want to be that kinsman redeemer. So he takes off his sandal and he gave it to Boaz in Ruth chapter 4 verse 7. This was a confirmation of Israel of letting go what belonged to him and letting it go to someone else. Then the widow, spitting in the face of her brother-in-law, was the greatest sign of disgust and humiliation and would make this unbiblical man ceremonially unclean. Then in verse 10, it says, And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal removed. I think there's an old baseball player, Shoeless Joe Jackson, right? He, him who had his sandal removed. And we read this and say, what is this, right? No, nobody cares. What's the big deal? The brother-in-law would get a new nickname. He'd have saliva on his face that he'd have to wipe off. To us, not that big of a deal. Maybe the spit part. But here, biblically, this was a name filled with shame and embarrassment. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, after Absalom completely embarrasses and humiliates his father David by sleeping with all his wives and his concubines on the roof of the palace, it tells us in 2 Samuel 15 verse 30 that David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up with his head covered and he went barefoot. Here we see that going barefoot was known as a walk of shame and humiliation. 
So now this man that was unwilling to be biblical and care for his deceased brother and care for his deceased brother's wife now lived a life marked by shame. Zach, how in the world do we apply this to us today? Hey, take care of your family. The, the biblical ways that you should take care of a brother or a sister or a husband or a wife or children, take care of that family. If not, you'll be known and be marked by the house of him who has much shame. Now we come to verse 11 and 12. Between you and me, I wish this wasn't in the Bible. I wish I didn't have to teach this, but this is when you go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. There's no room to run and hide from verses you don't like. So we'll get through it. It says, if two men fight together and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of the one attacking him and puts out her hand and seizes him by the genitals, then you shall cut off her hand and your eye shall not pity her. Guys, this is why we should be able to fight so that our wives don't have to step in, right? This is a great reference if you want to give to someone and check if they actually read the Bible references you're sending them. You can send this to them and see if they're actually reading the, the Bible here. Uh, and what a terrible situation. I'm just picturing their next date. The husband's full of shame. He got beat up. The wife now looks like a pirate. Just I don't know how they're... I don't know how their marriage continues after this. But judging by the context, by judging by the context, context is king as you read scripture. Judging by the context, we've seen how important it is in Israel from God for an Israelite to be able to carry on their lineage, their name, and their inheritance. So perhaps the strong judgment here. Though it never comes up again in scripture, we never see a woman being punished like this or this type of situation coming up. But perhaps the judgment is so strong to protect a man from being hurt so badly that he would no longer be able to have children and leave descendants. This would also protect God's people from immodesty. Matthew Poole, he says, partly to to deter all women from immodest and impudent carriages and to secure that modesty which is indeed the guardian of all virtues as immodesty is an inlet to all vices as the sad experience of this degenerate age shows and therefore it is not strange that it is so severely restrained and punished guys we got to get in better shape so we could defend ourselves right go to verse 13 through 16 Things you thought you'd never have to say from the pulpit. Verse 13 through 16. It says, You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who behave unrighteously, are an abomination to the Lord your God. In ancient times, they didn't have digital scales or digital ways to figure out how much this weighs or how much that weighs. So everything was done by these rocks that were used to weigh out the difference in in goods that were bought and goods that were sold. In Proverbs 16... Verse 11, it tells us, honest weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 10, it tells us, diverse weights and diverse measures, they are both alike, an abomination to the Lord. You see, God wants his people to have good character. God wants his people to be fair and honest in our business practices, in our buying and selling of goods. We are to be men and women of good character, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. Here, these men, as they would measure goods buying and sold, they would have a heavier, a heavier rock when they were selling something so they could give you less. And they had a lighter rock when they were buying so that they could collect more goods. 
And here it says that it's an abomination to God to behave with this type of character in our buying and selling. There's this old story of a, a man that comes to the man that he's always purchasing butter from. And he says, hey, whenever I go home, I weigh out the butter and it's always less than a pound. What's going on here? And the butter guy says, hey, every time I, you buy butter from me, first I buy a pound of wheat from you. And I measure out your pound of wheat with the pound of butter I sell you. And that's what's happening here. Everybody's trying to steal from one another. Just gain an inch, gain an ounce from everyone else. If you talk to Pastor Tony Falzione, he says in his BC days when he was a butcher, he called it the butcher's thumb. And whenever he sold you a pound of meat, he could put a couple more ounces on there to make more money. And here God says this is an abomination to him. We are to have one standard of measure when we buy and one standard measure when we sell. That word abomination, it's something that's loathsome, something that's detestable, something that has such a foul odor that it causes you to turn away from it. Now, many of us, we have that one stench that we can't stand. Maybe for you it's vinegar, maybe it's fish. For me, it's the smell of a wet sponge. It's something that makes me gross out every time. But here, what God is saying, that man, that woman, that has two different standards, it's disgusting to him. It causes him to turn away from it. And we need to pray and ask God that he would give us one standard of measurement. Because each and every one of us have a double standard, if we're honest. Maybe it's not in our buying and selling, but oftentimes it has to do with our sin to judgment ratio. When we sin and when we hurt the people around us, oftentimes you say, oh, it's nothing, it's no big deal, you need to toughen up, stop being a baby. But how do we respond when someone hurts us? When someone sins against us? God, pour out your vengeance upon them. And in an instant. I always liken it to when we see those red and blue lights in our rearview mirror, Oh, Lord, please, mercy. God, have mercy. And then when somebody cuts us off and we see the police pull them over, God, pour out your wrath, right? It's a double standard. And God hates this double standard. God hates partiality. It is completely gross to the Lord our God, and it causes him to turn away from such a stench. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it tells us that there's no partiality with God. We can turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Speaking of our work ethic, perhaps we don't have scales and weights that are different if we're buying or selling. But many of us, our work ethic, if we're honest, changes if our boss is present or not. Our work ethic, the boss is there, we're working hard, we're cranking projects out, the boss is gone and we're on social media, we're watching videos, we're doing all sorts of different things. But Colossians chapter 3 verse 23, it tells us, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Finally, 1 Peter 1.17, it tells us, If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. God, he sees everything. He's omnipresent, he's everywhere, he's omniscient, he sees everything, he knows everything. So if we are living with partiality, we have to be careful with that. We need to live and conduct our lives in holy fear. Even when it comes to forgiveness, we're told to forgive others in the same measure that Christ has forgiven us. That, that forgiveness, we can't have a double standard. In the same measure, he's forgiven us and we're grateful for his forgiveness we need to dish out that forgiveness to others. That we would do unto others as we would have them do 
unto us. Finally, and probably the most applicable thing here, verse 17 through the end of the chapter. Hopefully we'll end a little bit earlier tonight to give you back all the times I go over. Uh, Verse 17 and 18, he says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear When you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. We can turn to Exodus chapter 17. And in Exodus 17, this is Israel's first war or battle after they've come out of Egypt, after the Egyptian army has been destroyed by the Red Sea. This is the first battle that Israel has to face. And at first, it isn't a battle that both teams are ready for or both armies are ready for. But instead, the Amalekites first attack the nation of Israel. As they're a group of slaves, they come out, they attack them while they're weary and tired. And they focus on taking out the stragglers at the rear. After this, it tells us in Exodus 17, 8, that Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill And so it was when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. This battle began because Amalek fought And killed many Israelites before the war was ready to go. And Amalek and the Amalekites were descendants of Esau. These two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And Esau and the Amalekites are an Old Testament type for the flesh. And our flesh loves to attack. But especially when we're tired and weary. Our flesh, it loves to attack and take out the stragglers. Those believers who are drifting away. Those believers who are drifting away from the pack. Drifting away from the Lord. Drifting away from the fellowship. Drifting away from the serving. Drifting away from their devotional life. That's when the flesh comes out and attacks us. Even after Israel's victory... In Exodus 17, the Amalekites would join in on many of the attacks on Israel. And it's exactly how our flesh works. When we're tired and weary and exhausted that's, and we're tempted, that's when the flesh comes out and rears its ugly head. In Numbers 14, after the ten spies lead Israel to be fearful and not take the promised land, it tells us in Numbers 14, 45, that the Amalekites and the Canaanites came down and attacked them. Later on, in Judges chapter 3, during the time of Ehud, the second judge of Israel, it tells us that the people of Ammon and Amalek gathered together and defeated Israel. Then during the time of Gideon, one of the other judges in Israel, in Judges chapter 6, verse 3. So it was whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites and the Amalekites would come up against them. It seems as if whenever Israel was growing, the Amalekites and the flesh would come in and steal the harvest, steal the grain, steal the food out there. And Amalek was constantly battling Israel and joining the fight when Israel was already running backwards, was already being attacked, just like our flesh. You're having a bad day, and then your flesh comes out, and now you give in to temptation even worse. You're you're trying to stick to your diet, you have a bad day, and then you see the Taco Bell sign, right? And then your flesh comes out, 
You're tired, you're weary, you went to church, you went to church on a Wednesday night, you're driving out, and you see the golden arches, and your flesh comes out. It takes you there. It's just autopilot. You get right in there. But our flesh loves to rear its ugly head when we're already being attacked and tempted on other fronts. That's why when we're strong, we need to starve our flesh as much as possible. Family, what are we feeding on? What are we feeding on? The things we're watching, the things we're listening to, the books we're reading. Are they feeding our flesh or are they feeding the spirit? We can turn to Galatians chapter 5. And this is the war for the rest of our life here on earth is the battle of the flesh versus the spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 It tells us that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Uh, The key there to not fulfill the lust of the flesh is found in verse 16. It's to walk in the spirit. To be about our Father's business, to be doing biblical things and holy things and godly things, it will protect us and strengthen us from fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. We need to walk in the Spirit. And that's why the Israelites who were straggling behind were easy pickings for the flesh. Those that were walking in the Spirit, walking at the front of the line, They were protected. And Charles Spurgeon has this interesting point. They had just seen the armies of Egypt destroyed. Completely destroyed. And now they're at the rear. The only thing between them and the rest of Israel is the Red Sea. So perhaps they thought that was the safest place where they could lower their guard down. They didn't have to be as ready as those on the front lines that were entering into new territory and new territory and new territory. And when we trust in our flesh, when we rest and relax and we're not going on all cylinders chasing after the Lord, how easily the enemy swoops in and knocks us out. This is why back to Deuteronomy 25, verse 19, it says, Therefore it shall be, When the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. We see this is a big deal to the Lord. He tells him, hey, don't forget about this. We can fast forward and turn to 1 Samuel 15. And we're going to see here, it's centuries later, King Saul, the first king of Israel, I believe when Israel's finally at rest from all the surrounding armies of Canaan, they have their own land, they have their own territory, they have their own walls. Saul is given the task of wiping out the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1 through 3. It tells us that Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have And do not spare them. Kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Here God tells Saul to completely wipe out all of Amalek. Sadly, Saul would rebel and not be obedient to God's word. He would keep the very best, the very, the most fancy things, the nicest sheep, the prettiest clothes, and even King Agag, he would keep for himself. And sadly, this disobedience would be Saul's final undoing and final rejection of being king in Israel. 
In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 23, Samuel tells Saul that the rebellion, that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's also rejected you from being king. Again, we have to be careful. We have our own list of sins that we think are really bad sins and sins that aren't so bad. Oftentimes as parents, we can look at our kids and, oh, they're just a little bit rebellious. How cute. They're just a little bit stubborn. Ay, que lindo. Right? But here we see biblically rebellion. It's no different than witchcraft. And if you caught your kid in the backyard chopping off a chicken's head and doing some santeria, hopefully you'd freak out and say, what's going on here? But yet we we make it as something so little and so light. And then in our lives, oftentimes for the men here, we stay in our stubbornness. And we think our stubbornness isn't a big deal. Here God says it's as iniquity and idolatry. It's no different than the person that has all those idols in their front yard in Miami. Our stubbornness needs to be broken, and we need to be obedient to the word of the Lord. Later on, a group of Amalekites would plunder Ziklag and take king. No, he wasn't king yet, but David's wives and David's children in 1 Samuel 30. King Saul, even though he was unwilling to wipe out the Amalekites, later on in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 13, it would be an Amalekite who would take credit for killing King Saul. The final Amalekite that we see mentioned in the Old Testament is Haman, the main antagonist in the book of Esther. He was a descendant of King Agag, the king who Saul spared, and Haman is the last mention of an Amalekite, and Haman had a thirst of trying to wipe out God's people. And it's interesting how this chapter ends telling the nation of Israel to blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, you shall not forget. And here we're given two different ideas. When it came to the nation of Israel... And just one man in Israel's house, Israel was to do all they can so that that man would not be blotted out. So that that man would have descendants. And yet when it comes to Amalekites, they're commanded to completely wipe them out, completely blot them out, and not allow them to have one single descendant. You see, the key is found in that the Amalekites did not fear God. And here we take this to our personal application today. Brothers and sisters, we must protect with all that we have the spiritual blessings that lead us to fear the Lord our God. We have to do all that we can to protect those things, to bring them into our home. Even if there's a cost involved, we need to do all that we can to protect the spiritual blessings that lead us to fear the Lord our God. And then on the other hand, we must do all that we can to completely wipe out and eradicate our fleshly lusts which lead us to not fear the Lord our God. I hope we see that. If we're honest, Deuteronomy 25 is pretty tough on the personal application department. But we can definitely see here how God wants to protect the life and the lineage of the Israelites and their people. And he wants to completely wipe out any remembrance of the flesh and the Amalekites. So family, may we do our best to have no mercy on our flesh. Have no mercy upon it. Completely wipe it out. And even as it tells us at the end of Deuteronomy 25, you shall not forget. Don't forget about it. The the, the days that are easy and light, The days when you have rest, don't give your flesh any food. Continue to starve. Continue to starve that flesh each and every day. And continue to feed your spirit. Even if there's a cost involved, feed your spiritual state. So hey, let's go ahead and pray here. Worship team, you guys can come up. And then we'll close in worship. Hey, pastors, if you guys would come up front and we can all stand and close. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word and
Lord, thank you for the reminder, Lord, to completely wipe out the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lord, forgive us, forgive me, Lord, for that double standard, how small my sins look in my eyes, Lord, and how big the sins of my spouse, the sins of my kids, the sins and the people I don't like, Lord, how I make them so big. Lord, give us that single measuring stick, Lord. Give us your word, Lord. May we measure all of our life, Lord, all of the life of our friends, all of the lives of our enemies, Lord. Help us to measure it according to your word. And Lord, help us. Help us to cut off the flesh, Lord, to starve it out as much as possible. So Lord, we love you. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.